In this video, I'm going to show you how to get so much more accurate at retinoscopy. It's a masterclass, so I'm assuming you know the basics. If you don't, this isn't the video for you, really. Come back when you've covered the theory and maybe had a few goes at it. This is part two of my retinoscopy masterclass. I hope you enjoy it. In the first episode, we saw a few techniques that make you quicker and more efficient at retinoscopy. In this episode, we're going to take a look at a few things that should make you more accurate, or at least understand why you're not very accurate. Mostly, I do retinoscopy to give me an idea where to start and what sort of refraction it's going to be. I want to know whether I'm going to be using larger differences in my refraction and what sort of vision I can expect at the end of it. In most cases, I don't need to be super accurate uh, because I can refine the result with subjective refraction afterwards, but with young children or patients where subjective refraction is difficult or unreliable, I need to spend more time on retinoscopy to get as good a result as I possibly can, because I won't be able to rely on the patient's responses. To illustrate the points, uh, let's have another look at my friend Michael's retinoscopy and see how good his result was when compared to the result he got after his refraction. When we look at the ray diagrams and blur circles of his retinoscopy result compared to his end result, we can see that he did a pretty good job, but there seems to be a strange symmetry about them. I'm guessing that this is all to do with Michael's alignment when he's doing retinoscopy. Was he on the visual axis or was he a bit off axis? Let's have a look at the video stills again. You can see that in his consulting room, the chart is high up behind the patient, so he has to guess how high to move his head up to get exactly on the visual axis. He needs to be about eight centimeters above the patient's uh, eye level in this type of room I've worked out. <laughs> Obviously, I haven't got much to do with my time. He looks a bit higher to me, but it's hard to tell. If I want to be really accurate, uh, I usually get my patients to look at their own eyes in the mirror or a light switch or something at the same level as their eyes at the end of the room. Then I make sure that my eyes are at the same level as theirs. I don't worry too much about the fact that they might be accommodating a bit for the end of the room. So that covers vertical misalignment errors. What about horizontal alignment? At college, we're always told that to get the best alignment, we need to use the right eye with the right eye and then the left eye with the left eye. Most experienced practitioners I've watched never do this, uh, but if you want the ultimate alignment, you need to do this really. Even if it's a bit of a pain leaning over to pick up the lenses. I usually just dip my uh, ret into the eye and back out again, in and out. And that seems to work okay for me. It's interesting that this problem of alignment was well recognized by practitioners in the past. I bought this manual on eBay. Yeah, it's uh, for this Ferropter, which was manufactured uh, between 1927 and 1932. It really is nice, isn't it? Uh, this is what a well-equipped consulting room looked like back in those days. Notice how the mirror is on a level with the patient's eyes and is angled to see the chart. The manual also mentions that the chart should be tilted slightly forward so that it would seem square in the mirror. The Ferropter also came with a piece of equipment called a macular reflectoscope. This piece of kit 
allowed the practitioner to be exactly on axis using a, a clever system of mirrors. Presumably optometrists uh, or refracting opticians, as some of them were called in America in those days, had to rely on their retinoscopy much more, and so the macula reflectoscope was invented. Just one last thing on alignment. When you're prescribing glasses for children after instilling psychopentylate to stop them accommodating, measuring the correct part of the reflexes are very important. It's really important to get the child to look directly at the ret light. That way you, we know that we are on the visual axis and are likely to get the most accurate result. This is an animation of what it looks like. Very often there's a defined central reflex corresponding to the nucleus of the lens. It's very important to only neutralize the middle, ignoring what's happening around the outside. When you've neutralized both meridians, then move inside your working distance. Just go a little closer like this and finally check that both meridians are, have the same amount of width movement. If they don't, change the spheres and sills again until they do. This is how you get a really accurate result. When I worked in the hospital, I had to do lots of cycloretinoscopies on children with squints, so I got really good at it. What really helped me to be confident in the result was to concentrate on making sure that there was an equal width movement when I got that little bit closer. I also found it easier to do the retinoscopy with plus cylinders actually. It was much easier to see the cylinder axis with plus cylinders. So give it a try and you'll see what I mean. Obviously I refracted, or if I had to refract, I refracted in minus cylinder as it's a nightmare refracting in plus cells with a trial set. The patients keep accommodating when you change the lenses. So use plus cylinders at your peril in my opinion. Just one final tip. Uh, this tip only applies to those of you who are old like me, which probably isn't that many of you, but you do need accommodation to see the reflex properly. Otherwise, it's going to be blurry. I've got around this problem by taping a plus 150 on the back of the sight hole as I wear very focals, or you can use intermediate prescription as well with the plus 150 ad. Of course, it's a, a little better with the small sight hole, but take it from me, it's so much better with this lens. It doesn't look very nice, but it's so much better. Let's go through the clinical tips now. Firstly, get on axis, both vertically and horizontally, if you need to be accurate. Ask the patient to look at the retinoscope light in cyclopedic retinoscopy. Watch only the central reflex in cyclopedic retinoscopy. Move closer at neutral to check that both meridians show the same width movement. Try plus cylinder when doing cyclopedic retinoscopy. Retinoscopy needs accommodation, so if you don't have any, wear readers or tape a lens to the rear of the eyepiece, like I've done. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe to my channel, then you'll be notified when I make my next one. See you next time.